My name is CK Lee and today we're going to be flying a 1944 SNJ-5. Today I got to fly in an SNJ-5, a piece of American military history produced in 1944. This workhorse is powered by a Pratt & Whitney radial engine producing an impressive 600 horsepower. SNJ and its many variants remained popular throughout the 20th century among many military forces. Today we learn the history of 214 Mike Bravo. Yeah, I came to it through uh, my father. Uh, he was a pilot, an ag pilot down in Florida in the 70s and 80s. And uh, he and I used to fly together a lot when I was a kid. And it wasn't really until I was in my early 30s, about 20 years ago, that I started getting back involved and learning how to fly and all of that. And so I progressed through all of my ratings. And in 2006, we bought an airplane, a Beechcraft Baron. My wife and I used it for family travel, you know, for the last 15, 20 years. We've flown the Baron uh, just about everywhere in America you can fly. And I really wanted to get back into the fun part of aviation. Um, flying a Baron was great, but it's serious business and it's usually instrument flying and it's uh, usually in controlled airspace. And about 10 years ago, I bought a Stearman and uh, decided I wanted to fly old airplanes and started really learning, uh, perfecting my tailwheel skills. The airplane I've always wanted is the one behind me here. It's the AT-6 or SNJ-5 is what this one is. This airplane was made in 1944 as an AT-6D. It was converted shortly thereafter to an SNJ-5 for naval training and was accepted into the Naval Service in 1944 at Pensacola Naval Air Station. But the airplane was built here in Dallas. It fought the war at a variety of naval air stations around the country, uh, primarily at Glenview Naval Air Station in Chicago as a gunnery trainer. Uh, and we still have the barrel, at least, of the old 50 caliber machine gun that it had on it. And what's interesting about this airplane, uh, unlike a lot of historical airplanes, is I actually have a photograph of it when it was in service. The previous owner of this was a fellow named Vic Krause, and he was uh, very well known in the Warburg community up in the Midwest and he was at Oshkosh with it in the mid 90s and a fellow walked up to him and uh, a fellow named Ron Martin and said the serial number on the tail 43732 is that is that the serial number of this airplane and and Vic told him it was he said well I think I did my gunnery training in this airplane during the war I'll go home and check so a few months later uh, Vic got in the mail a photograph of Mr. Martin as a young man standing next to this airplane and you can see clearly the serial number of the airplane uh, in the photograph so there's no question that it was the one that that's here and it's very rare I think in the Warburg community to actually have a picture of your plane as it was configured when it caught, fought the war but it stayed in military service until the mid 1950s and uh, then it was sold to a Cuban national uh, interestingly enough, who took it to Havana in the late 50s and flew it out of Havana International Airport there. After the revolution, he flew this airplane at wave top level to Miami and uh, parked it at Miami International Airport and went back to collect his things and was never heard from again. And so the airplane was derelict at Miami. It was sold, taken into possession uh, by the Miami Airport Authority. They sold it. Uh, to a fellow there in Miami who flew it for several years. He sold it to a guy in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, who um, kept it for a number of years and flew it all through the 70s and into the 80s. And that's how it got the Mike Bravo name and uh, initials on the tail was the Myrtle Beach, you know, designation. This fellow took it all apart to restore it and then passed away. And so Vic Krause, the fellow we bought it from, purchased the airplane in the late 1980s and uh, went through a full tip to tail restoration of it and hung an overhauled engine on it. And it's been flying in the Midwest up until a couple of years ago when it came back home to Dallas where it was born. This engine and prop combination is a Hamilton standard 12D 40 prop sitting in front of a Pratt & Whitney 1340, which is a 600 horse. This engine served on a lot of different airframes. Most interestingly to me is it was the engine prop combination that was on my dad's crop duster when I was a kid. It has a very distinctive takeoff noise signature uh, it's the ends of this prop break the sound barrier. The AT-6 and the SNJs were advanced trainers in the Second World War. They were the last airplane that cadets would go through 
on their way to whatever they ultimately flew, whether it was a bomber or a transport or a, a fighter plane. You know, they did a lot of night work in it, a lot of instrument work. A lot of them were equipped with instrument hoods in the back where the, uh, the cadet could completely cover himself in canvas and learn how to fly at night and on instruments. They did basic carrier approaches in this, uh, in the Navy, uh, and they would kind of go on to these tanker vessels out in the middle of Lake Michigan where they would <laughs> sort of roll the wheels on and, and then sort of take off off the other end so they could practice their approaches and whatnot. It's an airplane that um, is very forgiving in most of the phases of flight. Uh, but it has certain things from a flight characteristic standpoint that it, it doesn't like. The stall is particularly vicious in this airplane. Uh, most of them that I've flown have pretty significant brakes, uh, either to the right or to the left. We've lost a lot of these airplanes and we've lost a lot of pilots uh, in maneuvers in the pattern and also ground reference maneuvers where you're the, the so-called grandma's house stall. You know, you're, you're circling over grandma's house and you keep loading up the airplane and getting slow. Uh, when it breaks, uh, you'll need five, six hundred thousand feet to recover from that maneuver. And in that case, many times if you're close to the ground, you don't have the opportunity to fix it. It's a very good teacher. It, it uh, will help you manage energy. It's a great aerobatic airplane. And there's something about sitting on top of 5,600 pounds of mid-century American air power that is, uh, it's great. It, it sort of gets the history bug in me going. It's not particularly fast and it's not a speed demon. It, uh, you know, I typically fly plan it for 145 to 155 miles an hour. It's got a supercharger on it, which is kind of an interesting, you know, phenomenon. It's the first airplane I've had that you didn't push the throttle all the way to the stops on takeoff. And then as you climb and the manifold pressure wears off, you've got a lot more throttle to go so you can make power all the way to altitude. And so the airplane gets really efficient at about 8,000, 10,000 feet. I would just say I'd, I'd put a shout out to the uh, North American uh, Trainer Association. Uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful type club for these airplanes, uh, the T6 and the T28s. Anybody interested in these airplanes sort of join that organization because it really does kind of give you a feel for the type. I just really feel like I've got, you know, all I can say grace over learning how to fly it and really understanding how it behaves in various conditions and um, and really getting familiar with the airplane. You ready to go fly? Sure, yeah, thank you. Well, while Dakota's getting ready to take you guys up for a flight, let me talk to you about the sponsor of today's video, Babel. You know, we're a little bit spoiled in the US, uh, as pilots anyway, because the international aviation language is English. So for pilots, you know, they fly into international airports, stuff like that, uh, the primary language they use is English. But that doesn't mean when you're traveling, it's not helpful to know the language. Quiero hablar español mejor. I want to speak Spanish better. So that's why I am using Babbel. I can just grab my AirPods, pull out my phone while we're underway, and uh, start working on the app. Babbel is one of the world's leading language learning uh, apps, and it's really easy to use. They kind of gamify it. They have short, simple lessons at anywhere from five to 15 minutes. And in as little as three weeks, they can have you start speaking a new language. There's plenty of languages to choose from. And a couple things they have going on right now is if you sign up right now, you can get 60% off your subscription to Babbel with the link, either the QR code that's over here, or there's a link down in the description if you'd like to do that. And also, there's a 20-day money-back guarantee. So you download the app, start using it, you know, maybe you start getting to speak Spanish if you don't like it, or whatever language you want, then you can cancel and get your money back. So thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this episode of Flying Doodles. Hey, I need to work on my Spanish a little more, and then, uh, you know what, maybe I can, uh, Dakota can take me down to Mexico on a flight or something. That'd be fun. But uh, thanks again, Babbel, and thank you guys for watching. And uh, be sure to click the link down below. Sign up. A little pre-oil. And clear. Arlington Municipal Airport, Arlington, Texas. Automated weather observation 1953, Zulu. Wind 300 at 16. All right, so the trims are now set at 10 and 2. Flaps are up, wheels are down, of course, and we have set the fuel on the left reserve tank. All right, my needle's moving. We're going to just, we got a long taxi in front of us, so it should be warm by the time we get there. So. Perfect. Arlington Ground, Texan 214, Mike Bravo. Texan 214, Mike Bravo, Arlington Tower Ground, altimeter 3022. 3022, and 4 Mike Bravo is Alpha 1 at Alpha. We have the weather, and we're ready to taxi. November 214, Mike Bravo, runway 34, taxi via Alpha. 
Okay, 3-4 via Alpha, 4 Mike Bravo. Temps are coming up good, all pressure is good. Okay, now we'll do a run up. All right. Basically stick back, we'll take it up to 17, 1800 RPM. Okay. Back check. Left. Right. Back to both. Cycle the prop three times. There's a good trim is set. Okay, so on takeoff with this airplane, you're gonna run it up to 36 inches manifold pressure, 2250 RPM. Okay. And uh, release the brakes, and then away we go. Keeping it straight with the feet, and then uh, bail will come up after a little bit, and uh, you know, usually flies off 65, 70 miles an hour or so, and just kind of keep it in ground effect, and let it run, and then once we know we're kind of in the air, and tracking good, and everything's looking good on the engine, we go ahead and retract the landing gear, and we'll make our turnout, so. Perfect, sounds good to me. All right. I'm ready. Arlington Tower, Texas 214, Mike Bravo is ready to go 3 4 at Alpha. We're at left turnout westbound this afternoon. Texan 214, Mike Bravo, good afternoon. Runway 34 cleared for takeoff left down. Correction, left turnout approved to the west wind 31013, just the 23. Caution weight turbulence, strap departing, what's the citation? Okay, 4 Mike Bravo, thank you. And we'll uh, 3 4. Clear for takeoff and left turnout. All right, the temps look good, oil pressure all looks good. I love the sound of these airplanes. Uh, it's gorgeous, isn't it? So 110 miles an hour is a good climbing speed on it. You know, it'll get you five, six hundred feet a minute. Okay. That's um, okay. At 30 and 20. All right, so we got a 3,000 foot Bravo above us, so we'll just go to 2,500 feet. Sounds good. You can definitely tell this airplane wants to fly. It came right up off that runway. Oh yeah, it's gorgeous. All right, so we're at 2,500. We'll pull back to 26 inches of manifold pressure and 1,800 RPM. Every power change and every configuration change, you must trim it. It's like just how these things are wired. Steerman's the same way. The T6 is a, is a, is a wonderful airplane because it's very honest. And if you get it in a mess, it's because you put it there. Ah. It didn't just try to kill you, you know? And, right. and so it, it answers the controls well. It, uh, it, it will do what you ask it to do. But the problem, you know, is you get you know, guys like me that are new to them and don't respect it or bring your prior experience to it and you think you're gonna apply that here. And, you get the airplane in a boogered up position, and right. you know, I always say that you know, it takes a lot of confidence to get in something like this and fly it, but it's the most counterintuitive thing in the world. You also have to be extremely humble right. and uh, just recognize that you know, this is a lot of airplane and it's got a lot of weight. So that you know that sort of pilot humility uh, doesn't often sit well with people who wind up in warbirds, but you know it's, I think it's just a critical personality trait that you have to bring to the cockpit with you. Absolutely. I mean, even beyond this, any time you go up in the air, yep. it doesn't matter what, you'd be flying a 152. If you don't respect your airplane, yep. you're messing with something that's a lot bigger than you. Absolutely. Yeah, they haven't been able to repeal the laws of physics yet, or gravity. Not yet. I said, okay, so here we are. You know, we're at 2,500 feet, 26 inches or so of manifold pressure, and uh, 1,800 RPM. It's running along at about 150, 165 miles an hour, indicated. 
the airplane loves days like this, you know, it's so cool and yes. crisp and it's... Uh, That's beautiful, it's a gorgeous day too. Sun's out after that cold front came through last night. Yep. Plus Texas is nice and green now. Yep. After some of the rain. Have you been tempted to uh, go off fly the airlines? I don't know. I like flying the airplane, I really do. I've thought about 135 just as a side gig, but like... Um, I really love teaching, so that's why I kind of want to get back into that part-time, and I'd love to eventually, like, get my DP, and then doing this on the side, you know, gets me in a bunch of different airplanes, and... Yep. It's a disease, and there is no cure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's just something... General aviation is just a thing of its own. Really? No question. What's the fuel burn like? Okay, so in cruise, you know, I fly planted it, you know, 30 gallons an hour. Okay. Gotta be a little conservative, but good, good, good number to calculate to. That's not too bad with the 110 gallons you said. Right. Yeah. It's so. A couple hours. Yeah, you can run it three hours. Of course, it, it's plant card is 110, but you kind of have to be aware that when you're fueling it, it's sitting on the tail wheel, which right. means there's a little bit of that fuel tank that you can't get gas into. Right. And uh, so you have to assume that you know your real capacity is. You know, somewhere 100, 105. I mean, usually every two and a half hours, that's about how often you want to get out anyway. So. Yeah, it gets you, it gets you, you know, 300, 400 yeah. miles down range, and then, you know, it's, like you say, you're ready to go stretch your legs. Yeah. There's Borland Field, up there. Blown over them lots of times. Uh, other than the avionics and, you know, the transponder radios, did you really have to do any major modifications or or fixing really anything up or did you pretty much buy this airplane as is? We bought it as is and uh, we needed to do some work on the uh, on the avionics right. to, uh, to kind of upgrade a lot of that but otherwise you know it's it's just normal maintenance and you know they're not terribly hard to maintain the systems right. are pretty simple you, know, you got a hydraulic system and you know that could leak or develop issues and then you know, the electrical system is pretty straightforward, you know. Right. There can't be very many of these flying anymore, right? More than several hundred? You know, they made 15,500, give or take, of them, okay. you know, over the full life, you know, starting in the mid-30s when the first prototypes came out. And I think now, you know, operationally flying regularly, you know, I've heard various numbers, but it's in the hundreds, you know, 500, 100 maybe. A lot of museums, you know, this thing was a trainer, not just in America, but you know, in the UK, trained their pilots in it, and a lot of their dominions overseas, you know, used the T-6, and then, you know, it's just dozens and dozens of countries, you know, used it as a primary trainer or an advanced trainer. The last country to take them out of service was South Africa in 1995, you know, they trained their pilots all the way up to the mid-90s, and so that fleet, when that came available, all of their spares, their engines, uh, the aircraft, the airframes and everything, a lot of that made its way back to the States, you know, and guys bought them. And, you know, it really kind of replenished our supply back here. Right. So, uh, it's so cool. I love it. It's like sitting on a piece of history. It really is. It's just, uh, it's so cool. To think of all the missions this airplane has flown. Now here it is, just bouncing around to Grand Bearing. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in it. I know, right? We'll just do a turn over Granberry here. Enjoyed a few minutes of scenic flying over Granberry before heading back towards Arlington to land. It's clear in a billion today. Yeah, it really is gorgeous. When it comes to the uh, landing capabilities of this airplane, what is like your minimum runway? You know, I'm taking it into 3,000 foot strips, no problem. I would do a little less than that. Okay, and that's plenty for taking back off too? Yeah, yeah. Cool. That's nice. Arlington Tower, Texan 214 Mike Bravo, 9 miles southwest, uh, inbound landing and requesting an overhead initial approach, please, to 34. Section 214, Mike Bravo, all the tire, suggest heading 030 to avoid opposite direction traffic southbound, just departed on the right down, correction left down on departure. 
Report three mile initial. Respect left break. Okay, zero three zero three over four three mile initial. We'll respect the left break for four Mike Bravo. Okay, we're gonna put the fuel back on the deepest tank and send it set like I want it to. Believe the mixture and props where they are for now. The max are on both. We got oil pressure. We got oil temperature. Texan two one four Mike Bravo. Left break approved. At your discretion. Report break. Left break at my discretion. will report for Mike Bravo. I'm sure the tower guys probably enjoy watching y'all fly around too. Yeah, I don't get many right breaks. They want <laughs> they want it to go by right in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the way this works is you're going to just um, keep power on it because you don't want to cool the engine too fast, and you're going to just go uh, to descend a little blow pattern altitude over the runway, and then you pitch up to get the gear speed, which is 150, and then we'll drop the gear. Okay. Once we uh, turn in face, we'll drop the flaps. Um, then maintain 90, to 90 miles an hour all the way through the uh, approach uh, until you got landing assured, then it's power off and flare. All right. I'm ready. So we'll wait until we get past the tower here. Tower Texan 4 Mike Bravo is on the left break. Texan 4 Mike Bravo, runway 34, cleared land, wind 30012. 3-4, clear to land, well, Mike Bravo. Okay, the pins are moving. And I've got red, and I've got red. I've got two greens. So the gear's down, remember we talked about that? Right. We'll open the cockpit. We're moving along at about 105 miles an hour, which is good for this phase of the landing process. And here come the flaps, and you'll feel the configuration change it really drops the oh, nose yeah. so now you wow. can see which is you know pretty important and we're right on our 90 mile an hour speed we'll start the process of coming around so the flaps are down I'm confirming that I've got the gear down confirming that now we have the landing assured so we'll go ahead and come off with the power Using the center line is a good... Stick all the way back. Texan 214 Mike Bravo, turn right taxiway Echo, taxi to parking and monitor the ground. Right at Echo to park and monitor the ground for Mike Bravo. Nice. That was a nice touchdown. A little gusty wind. Yeah. It did, it felt very tame coming in at that 90. Yeah, it's like, it's where it, you can just tell, it's kind of where it likes yeah. to live. And, you can and, tell uh, it was happy, yeah. Yep. Well, that was awesome, thank you so much for taking me up. Absolutely. It's always a great airplane to share, you know, because yeah. it's just such a historic relic. and It's a piece of history. It is, for sure. And we'll monitor ground. Like the man said, yeah, you want to do what those guys say. Thank you again for, you know, giving me this fly today. It was awesome. This airplane's a cool piece of history and I really enjoyed it. It's fantastic. It was great flying with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to leave us a like, comment, and subscribe for more. If you have an airplane that you want to show off, then make sure to send me an email, dakota at flyingdoodles.com. And a big thank you to our patrons. Make sure to check us out, patreon.com slash flyingdoodles.